When I started working on spiders, I had no idea how interesting they were. I had no idea. I mean, these organisms have been making silk for hundreds of millions of years, and they're all using silk in a slightly different way. We're still finding new kinds of silk all the time. So when you see an orb web, it's like, guarantee you don't know the whole picture. And it's only when you get up close that you realize how cool they are. I'm Cheryl Hayashi. I'm a curator at the American Museum of Natural History, and I study the evolution of spiders and spider silk. In my research, I'm characterizing the diversity of spider silks. And I do this to understand how silk evolved how it works and what it means to spiders. And that's what keeps me up and I just these fundamental questions. So spiders are the only animals that really rely on silk throughout their entire life. Sort of every part to eat, to reproduce, to wrap eggs, to transfer sperm. They make their homes out of silk. But some species don't use silk as much as others. I mean, they still will use silk almost every day of their life, but they may not rely on silk for foraging. While other spiders, like orb web weaving spiders, are absolutely tied to silk production, and they use those silks for all kinds of purposes. If you look inside the abdomen, it's packed with silk glands. It's not as if there's like spools of thread. It's actually liquid silk stored inside the silk glands. So the liquid silk goes through the duct, it dehydrates, and the silk proteins start aggregating with each other. So when you see a spider dropping down, you're actually watching in real time. Liquid silk being turned into a solid fiber. It's an amazing transformation. Well, just really captivated me about spiders was the diversity of silk that one individual spider can make. Picture an orb web. There will be an outer frame, and there will be radii from a center point that go out. So that kind of silk is made from dragline silk, or we call it major ampullate silk. That's a strong and fairly extensible silk. Then there's the capture spiral. That's a composite of two kinds of silk. There's a filament, dotted with glue on it. But in making the orb web, a spider will have used a silk called minor ampullate silk or temporary silk. Then she actually uses that temporary spiral as a guide as she lays down the real capture spiral. And while she's doing it, she consumes the temporary spiral. When you think about why a spider might make so many different kinds of silk, it really comes down to function. The frame and the radii need to be stiff to support the web. But if a web was made entirely of strong and stiff fibers, it might be a lot easier for an insect to just bounce off of it. So capture spiral silk stretch along, absorbing the impact of that insect. And the little gluey, gluey droplets stick to the insect's body, and it holds the insect in place and gives a spider time to come down and, and actually catch their prey. So whether we're talking about egg case silk, dragline silk, capture spiral silk, or prey wrapping silk, they all have different functions and they all have different material properties. Spiders that make multiple kinds of silk, they actually have multiple types of silk glands. And so when it's time to make a web, the spider is actually touching her leg to the correct spigot to pull out the correct silk in the correct place on the web at the correct time. So I want to find out exactly what genes are turned on in all those different silk glands within a spider. So for that, I need to have fresh silk glands. And so I have a lot of live spiders in the lab so I can collect their silk and collect their silk glands. I have a variety of garden spiders. I have a golden orb weavers. I also have black widows. And I also have feather-legged spiders. I collect silk from spiders in two different ways. I take these little cards that I make out of poster board and I collect fibers onto that card. The other way I collect silk in the lab is I expose the spider to carbon dioxide gas and that anesthetizes them for a few minutes. And I gently tape them to the microscope stage so that I can actually visualize which spigot a silk fiber is coming out of so then I know exactly what silk I'm collecting. And when I'm done, they live to silk another day. After I've collected the silk, the way I test the fibers is I put it in what's called a tensile tester. 
and the machine pulls up at a controlled rate. And as it pulls up, it's measuring the resistance of the fiber to being pulled. And it's also measuring how far the fiber can stretch. And with that, you know, I can really compare a large number of different kinds of silks. The silk protein genes are activated in the silk glands. Each gene we're finding, they might be dramatically different from each other. That leads to dramatically different mechanical properties. Silk in the capture spiral can extend over twice its original length. There's not that many filaments that can do that. Many dragline silks are tougher than Kevlar, which is just amazing thinking that, you know, within a spider just out in your yard and these super fibers are coming out of it. And when you look at the whole diversity of spiders, there's just an immense variations on this. So the honest truth is, it's almost like my research is becoming fractal. What I thought was one silk turns out to be two silks. What I thought was gonna be one silk gene turns out to be sometimes five silk genes. In a sense, I have gotten trapped in a spider web and you know, the silk envelops sort of all aspects of my research. But I'm not fully trapped because I think the spider silk system, it's a great model for seeing how you can integrate evolutionary biology, genetics, organismal biology. Even, let's say you're interested from the biotech aspect of it. There's just huge potential there. There are lots of research being done into how we can mass produce silk either to make better clothing, maybe lighter airplane or car parts, or implants that could be used in the human body. And so spider silk, it's coming to, to your world. Hey there, this is Luke Groskin, video producer for Science Friday. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, then you'll love our other short science documentaries. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, then join our growing community of supporters on Patreon.